Contractors struggle with time management because of a full pipeline, fewer complete drawings, tighter job deadlines, and a much tighter labor market. In addition, there are issues with coordination with other trades, distribution, and owners. Construction software promises to solve or lessen the impact of many of these struggles. However, there is always room for improvement. I asked my former coworker and friend, Adam Ketterer, co-founder and senior sales director at AEC Inspire, to come on and discuss what advancements he's seeing in construction software. Adam is a co-founder of AEC Inspire, an AI-based takeoff software for electrical projects. He comes from a third-generation electrical contracting family and spent most of his career in distribution and manufacturing. He is passionate about solving the skilled labor shortage and construction by leveraging software, prefab, and logistics services to provide the right materials and information to the right people at the right time. In his free time, he coaches sports for his kids, volunteers in the community with his wife of 15 years, and tells as many dad jokes as possible. Welcome to Keeping the Lights On. I'm your host, Todd Reed, and on this podcast, I connect with the owners and pros who design, build, and maintain our electrical, communications, and industrial world to explore the best ways forward. Let's get into the show. So, you know, I like to start out each episode with the meals that bring us together because we're doing that, right? We're trying to learn new ideas and learn from each other and kind of maybe learn some things that we're not used to thinking about. And a good place to do that is a meal because it kind of mm-hmm. loosens you up and all that stuff. And unfortunately, most of the time, I don't get to have that meal with my guests, right? Because it's usually remote. But this time, after this interview, we're going to go actually go to the place that Adam's talking about, which mm-hmm. is pretty cool. We're going to have some, hopefully, some nice B-roll footage of uh, Adam and I enjoying the meal uh, and seeing the place we're actually we're going to talk about right now. So, Adam, if someone were, someone were going to visit you mm-hmm. or you're going to go after a podcast, where might you take someone to eat? It's a little place in my hometown of Ferguson, Missouri, called Paul's Market. It's a a meat market, like a neighborhood grocery store from the 1950s, and it hasn't changed much since then. Uh, So you can go there and get your steaks or or whatever you're going to grill on a weekend or a holiday. Uh, And then you can also, you know, there's fresh vegetables they get from across the highway at Gokies, where they have the the Mm. farm fresh vegetables and what have you. But my favorite part is the hot lunch counter. So they've got, you know, the Chester fried chicken, you got the Traeger burgers, and on Thursdays, you've got Dottie's meatloaf. Oh, yep. And you've it's also not Thursday, darn it, it. It's not, but you know, I know Dottie, maybe we can work something out. But uh, then they got all the sides and everything else. So sure. it's it's not where you go if you're on a diet. Uh, okay. but, but if you're going to go there for a good, you know, hearty meal, it, it, nothing better. Wow. Yep. So what well, what do you like to get there? Obviously, the meatloaf's a big one. Is there something else that you really like to get? Depending if it's I'm a, I'm a sucker for those burgers. You know, mm. put a piece of pepper jack on there, all the toppings and everything, and then I uh, get my veggies for the side because you know I try make to you make you feel better about yourself. Make my mom proud of me, and then a lead by example for those kids, right? Because okay. if they see meat and vegetables, you know they're still less likely, they're not not very likely to eat them, but at least they know they should, right? right? And someday it might wear off on them. Okay. All right, so we're going to go have lunch together, right? And that might, who knows what we're going to talk about there because we can talk. Well, Guy's the limit. New decks, new whatever. So, anyway, but if you were to take a contractor there, mm-hmm. right, who you talk to, an electrical contractor, who you talk to a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you're going to have lunch with an electrical contractor there, what, what are some of the challenges that you believe that they would bring up? Because you talk to them a lot. Time. Time is the biggest topic, whether you're talking to the owner who's trying to, you know, can't find enough skilled labor in the field or the office, or just trying to understand the, understand the constantly changing landscape of technology that they can adopt and bring into their organization, uh, down to the, the field foreman, who is, needs to be spending his time in the field with the guys, but instead he's in the job trailer figuring out order quantities and what he needs mm-hmm. to order or material to release. And an estimator, they're always, you know, they need to value engineer those drawings and double check their work because they want to make sure they get a a good estimate out the door. Mm -hmm. But they're spending all their time counting symbols. And then the same thing with a a detailer, the design department. They're doing the same thing that the estimator just did, but they're having to count everything. Uh, VDC guys, BIM guys, you know, they need to model their, their, what, what they're supposed to, to model in the, in the, you know, for the project and then coordinate and, you know, the collisions with other trades and then extract mater- or information and give it to purchasing prefab in the field. So whether you're the owner, the, the estimator, the, the PM who's trying to pre-plan a job and communicate effectively to the team, 
it, it all comes down to time that they need back in their day to be able to do the higher level things that oftentimes the, the busy work doesn't allow them to get to. So you mentioned a lot of different people in a lot of different areas, and, uh, and there's probably many more you didn't mention in the whole chain of a construction project. But what mm-hmm. about coordination? Do they bring that up and like concerns around that or anxiety? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great one. And it's, it's, there's a, a term called the sawtooth effect. Okay. that my colleague and, and one of our co-founders, Lonnie Compton, introduced me to a, a few years ago. And it's the idea, if you think about a, a, a saw blade, the, the tooth of the blade, you know, information, or it goes up and then it, and it drops back down. And that's the same thing in the process of dissecting and planning a project. So uh, each person in the process will build up information and then they'll pass off a deliverable and they can, you know, it's a drawing or a spreadsheet or, or something. And you'll lose a lot of that information they built up. And the next person in the process rebuilds that information, and then they mm. pass off something. So that sawtooth effect happens where the next person line just has to redo a lot of the same effort that the past person did. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of redundant, but it's the process that most people live with every single day. So if, you know, I hear you say, because, yeah, so much stuff's done electronically now, which is great. And I think it's supposed to save us a ton of time and coordination issues. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious. So... Like if I built a, a spreadsheet, mm-hmm. one, two, three, ABC, shouldn't that information be the same when I hand that off to you? I mean, what are, what are we losing in that translation of me handing that off to you? It depends on the level of detail in that spreadsheet, right? Okay. And also, you know, what was that spreadsheet built for? So an estimator typically just needs to spot and dot information on a project, okay. get those counts, and then they apply information to that to come up with an estimate. Okay. But it's not down to the depth of the mud ring that needs to be ordered in that specific assembly. Mm. It's more of a high level. It, it's an educated, very educated guess right. at what it's going to cost to do that project. Okay. Post award, once a project's been awarded, the the detail into the design process has to take over, and those guys have to get very specific because mm-hmm. they're ordering material. Okay. So that's it's just a different level of specificity when it comes to that handoff of information. Okay. And so it's, yeah, coordinating those people's information together. Because then when you get down to the field guy, you know, he oftentimes is counting that same stuff again. Okay. And, and that's where, uh, you know, he either didn't get the information from the other people or didn't trust it. Yeah, okay. Well, I was just <laughs> I'm hearing a couple of things. Maybe potentially a lack of trust in mm-hmm. the person that's doing the prior step. Mm-hmm. And then also maybe not understanding the assumptions that go behind the data. We've talked about, you know, there's software out there. It's great stuff. I mean, there's you work with some, you know, you work with um, your own. There's pl- tons of other great uh, software out there helping contractors get elements of their jobs done well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, okay, so why hasn't this solved the sawtooth effect? I mean, we mentioned a couple, maybe trust and assumptions, but maybe can you get a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, so in my experience, the software available today until, you know, we came along and did what we did is either specific to a, a particular role in the process, say like estimating software. You know, it's specific to electrical contractors, mm. but it's specific to the estimator and the electrical contractor. And that software might not have the functionality and features that the designers or the field guys would need to do their jobs effectively. Okay. And then when you move to the next step, you know, you've got uh, VDC departments and BIM guys, they use Revit or, or, you know, some guys still use AutoCAD. And and those are great for those guys, but an estimator is not going to use those applications to do their job because they just have to get the information much more quickly than those softwares allow. And those are much Mm -hmm. more detailed. And then in between there, you've got, you know, PDF markup tools, because a lot of times you're just working off of 2D prints. Mm -hmm. And those might be specific to construction, but they're not specific to electrical. So it's 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 usually just tools are built for people, and nobody's really taken a step back and said, "Let me help the entire process." Yeah. They're point solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. that's correct. Yes. Interesting. Yep. All right. Well, let, let's start to move towards some of those solutions. Um, how how can software begin to solve those challenges of coordination and reducing the sawtooth effect? And I'm going to ask that again. Just yeah. real quick. All right. Well, you set out the challenge as well. I mean, the point solutions, trust, and all the others. But let's start to move towards some solutions and some ideas that contractors can start to hear about. Um, How can software begin to solve these challenges with coordination and reducing that sawtooth effect? So everybody has heard machine learning and artificial intelligence, 
right? Chat GPT is really the, the groundbreaking technology that millions of people are using now to summarize data, uh, effectively communicate information, and that's what people think about. So what we're doing is we're taking those same tools and applying them to the electrical contractor and the, the workflow of a project. So we've taken that step back and said, okay, let's look at what's the main function of the estimator? You know, they're spotting it out and counting up things and applying information to it. But then the next person in line, you know, they have to then leverage, ideally use that information and then take a head start into the detailing phase of the project and get really detailed. So we can, we've built a process that allows them to leverage the counts that the estimator may have used. And, and sometimes the estimator doesn't want to change, right? They're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. So the detailer can still use our technology to rapidly use machine learning and AI to get those counts much faster. You know, let the machine count 95% of it, and then you just spend your little bit of time figuring out the last 5% that, you know, no drawings are perfect. Yeah, right. So they can go through and find those last few hidden symbols. But instead of spending your entire time, you know, spotting and dotting all these things, clicking one time and uh, one at a time, uh, or worse yet, highlighters and clickers, that <laughs> still exists in the industry. I, I sure. estimate 20, 25 percent of people are still highlighters and clickers, which is the same way my, my grandpa did it back in 1948 when he started KB Electric. I mean, clickers, you mean little number counters? Like, yep. his, oh, that's yep. interesting. And then okay. they'll write that down and then fill it into a spreadsheet. Sure. But that's hard to go back and double check your work. Yeah. So at least if you're doing an on-screen takeoff, it's at least digital and you can go double check a little faster. But what we've done is we've made it even easier for the contractor to, or whoever the role is, to get those initial counts. And that gives them back that time so they can double check and they can value engineer. So yeah, it's, it just comes down to taking those buzzwords of machine learning and AI and bringing them into electrical construction in an easy to use, cloud-based platform that has benefits from the beginning of a project, the estimator, all the way through to the field installer. Do you have an uh, example of you know someone that's done, kind of gone through this process and experienced that? Uh, every, every week I find somebody else that's either highlighter and clicker or they're, they're using another platform and because a lot of these platforms already have auto counting tools. Sure. And, okay. but I've, I've found that less than 1% of people actually use them just because they don't trust them. Either the setup takes too long or it just doesn't come back with accurate information. And so they just say, well, I just count it myself anyway. Mm. So what we do is we show them how, how easy it is to leverage the machine learning and AI to find those initial counts. And then like, oh my God, this is incredible. And, it, and it's just super user friendly because we really focus on the user experience. And then when you get them and show them the first project on a live project, hey, this thing works, usually that's all they need. And they're like, all right, I'll, I'll make the switch because <laughs> you get back that time yeah. and they can do everything they, they've always wanted to get done, but they never had time to do. Yeah. That's the best selling point possible. Well, okay, so how can the use of this software um, help with the transition? Uh, I don't know if transition is the right word, but to VDC, modular, prefab construction, all these, you know, it's, it's hardly modern, it's hardly new anymore, but you know, th these concepts that construction needs to move into to get the job done. Great question. Uh, so VDC or, you know, virtual design and construction or BIM departments, you know, building information modeling, most people think of that as um, 3D modeling and Revit, right? That's where they, their brain goes. But really what you're doing is you're building a digital plan for the project. So that can be done in 3D or in 2D, right? Because 3D is great for large systems that you need to coordinate with other trades. You know, if you're going to coordinate with another trade, if you have a Revit model on that project, you know, you're not going to use AC Inspire for that. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't need to do the in-wall typically or the branch circuitry. So a good example of that is uh, contractors will do the, the, you know, the electrical rooms, the, the panels, the, the gear. They'll do the home runs that go down the, the hallways of the building up in the ceiling mm -hmm. that coordinate with the, the mechanical, the plumbing, the sprinkler fitters. And once they figure that out and they get down to the collection can and that branches out into the, the rooms, that stuff doesn't need to be modeled. But oftentimes contractors will default to that because like, well, that's what our prefab process requires. Mm. We said, well, just take that collection can of the drawing, you know, flatten that 3D model and create a PDF, upload into our software, and then from there, do all your branch wiring, which in some projects is the majority of the project. 
and doing that in 3D, you know, those modelers are like, man, if I never have to model in wall again, <laughs> I would be a happy person. Right. So once they see our solution and realize we're able to give them 95% of that same information, we just can't give you the isometric drawing. But most guys in the field throw that in the trash as soon as they see it anyway. They just need a 2D print that says, you know, what's that assembly? What's the label? How high do I need to install that? And what circuit does it get connected to? Mm -hmm. You give them that information, they'll get the job done. So it's, it's all about how can you get the right information to the right person at the right time. And uh, so if a project has VDC requirements, that's a great workflow that we you know, integrate into that workflow. And oftentimes, you know, the, the majority of projects don't have VDC requirements, so there is no Revit model. It's just 2D prints. Mm -hmm. Well, in those worlds, if there's no coordination with other trades, it's just get your plan done fast, get your stuff installed, and then make the other guys go around you. Now, you might have to move a few things, but sure. we can rapidly quantify that entire project from the feeders all the way through to that last last outlet. And that you get your bill of material, you give the information to the installer, but also you, you have that time, because you mentioned prefab in there, to figure out, okay, we've got a plan now, and, and we do it fast enough, then you say, okay, well, what do we want to prefab? Or better yet, what do we have to build on site? Then you can extract that data you can then work with the prefab shop, say, all right, you're gonna build this stuff, we're gonna build this stuff on site. And you can also work with your distributor mm. because it comes down to material management on that project as well. And yeah. if you pre-plan the job and you can work with your distributor to deliver everything on wheels that fits through doorways, that's gonna allow the, the skilled labor to get access to the material much closer to the point of install. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I call the, the, the golden triangle. You use software at the top to build that plan out. Then you leverage prefab, which countless studies have shown is the greatest way to reduce peak labor and reduce labor cost on a project, which is the bulk of the cost of a project. Not that we're against labor at all. It's There's not enough labor. There is a skilled labor shortage out there. There's mm -hmm. not enough electricians and plumbers and carpenters to, to get the work done that we need done. So that's why software and prefab is so important to build the plan, to figure out what you can prefab. And if you layer on top of the other corner of that triangle, distribution or logistics services, putting that material on carts and delivering it as close to the point of install as possible, that's where contractors are able to reduce their peak labor, reduce their labor costs by up to 50%, which means they can take on more work. They can grow the business. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, by the way, it's safer. Yeah. Fewer bodies on the project means higher safety ratings, lower insurance costs. Yeah. So it's it really is just about building the plan and then executing that plan with as much prefab and logistic services as possible. Yeah, I mean, walking, I'm not spend as much time as you on job sites, but job sites are dangerous places. So yeah, the, mm -hmm. the more you can reduce people walking around that, the, mm -hmm. the better. Um, all right, do you have an example of how this has come all together on a project? Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's... I know I call it the golden triangle. My friend Mike Quella, my colleague, calls it the golden workflow. So we're, we do have a, a few contractors. We, we primarily start with the design team and the prefab manager because they're feeling the most pain. They're the ones that oftentimes don't have customized solutions for them, right? Mm. So those are the guys that are, are asked for, hey, here's a bar napkin with an assembly I need, and I need <laughs> 250 of these by tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and it's 2.30 p.m. Like that, that's not possible, right. but that's what prefab managers are asked all the time. So that's where we find our, our typical audience. And then from there, we branch mm -hmm. kind of upstream into designers and, and, and detailers, and then even into estimation. And then we also go downstream into superintendents and field foremen, because all of those people need to grab information and, and they need to communicate that information. Uh, and then once they see that this software can help them do their role better, but also help the next person in line, that's the added incentive to make the change. Because I'm not just going to do my job better, but I'm going to set up the, the rest of my company for success. So that the golden workflow is, you know, the estimator gets their counts, and then they take those counts, they customize the output, and then they key it into their favorite estimating software. Mm -hmm. But our feedback from our customers is that we're saving them 75% of the time of getting those counts, mm. which is the vast majority of their job. That gives them time to value engineer the project, to double check their work, and to put in a really good estimate that they are confident that they can build for, but hopefully low enough to win the work. 
right? Yeah, estimates is something I've heard that brings a lot of anxiety, right? Because I mean, just at any business that's doing something like that, again, my wife deals yeah. with that. Like, did I do it right? Oh boy. <laughs> the day you win a project is the you know exciting and terrifying, right? Because right? then yeah. you say, well, what did everybody else bid? Oh boy. <laughs> how how low was I? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but you have more time to double check it, right? And yeah. then the detailer, the design team, when they step into it, they don't have to respot and dot. They can grab all those counts and then very quickly, you know, grab a, a say a 2R for a duplex receptacle. And there might be thousands of them on the project. Select all of them at one time with a few clicks and convert that into an in-wall duplex assembly. And what we do on, on the onboarding process is we help contractors standardize their assemblies using component parts. Mm -hmm. And then we bake those into the software. So then once they've said, all right, these two R's are my base build, and they're typically 18 inches off the ground, and they're going to use a three-quarter inch mud ring, that's fine. But then they go and say, well, these are firewalls. That requires an inch and a quarter inch or inch and a quarter mud ring. So they go in there and very quickly select all those, and they convert the mud ring to inch and a quarter. And they say, oh, these are all above counter. So there might be some tile there. Well, that requires an adjustable mud ring. Mm -hmm. So they quickly grab those and adjust that to an adjustable mud ring. So now we've got all these diff variations of a two R duplex assembly, but it has the right detailed information that they can export out, give to the purchasing guy, he can buy all the right component parts, and then they can have the right label on there. So when they build, give to the prefab shop, hey, here's what you're building, you know, this many of the base build that has the three quarter inch, this many of the above counter that has the adjustable, and this many of the firewall that has the inch and a quarter, they label them appropriately, they package them up for the field guys, and the field guy gets an install sheet that has the appropriate label for all those assemblies. So when they open up that tote, they've got their install sheet, They've got their assemblies. Mm. They can also have pre-cut MC connections that are all standardized lengths as well, which speeds up the process even more. And then the journeyman just puts it in front of the wall. The apprentice puts it in the wall. They wire it up to the junction box, and then they move on to the next room. It, when that golden workflow is working, that allows contractors to pre-plan way more jobs than they typically do. Mm -hmm. Two of my favorite questions are, okay, how much or what percentage of your projects go through your detailed VDC and design process? All right. And then what percentage of revenue does that represent? And oftentimes it's the bigger projects that do represent a significant part of the revenue. Mm -hmm. But then to think about it like, oh, but we have this whole bucket of other projects that we never pre-design. Well, somebody's going to have to figure that out. And that means that guy in that field, like my little brother, a journeyman foreman here in Local 1 in St. Louis, Pre-AAC Inspire, every day, what are my guys working on? What material do I already have on site? What material do I need to order? You know, write it on a broken piece of drywall, call it into an inside guy, hope he doesn't mess it up, and then pray it shows up on time. And that's just not an effective process. Mm -hmm. If it's pre-planned out, he's saying, hey, send me this scope box or kit on this day. Send me this one on this day mm -hmm. and this one on that day. And he knows what's going to be in there. That allows him to spend two minutes figuring out his material instead of two hours every day. And he spends more time with the field electricians because of that skilled labor shortage, the, the labor we have today, they're not 30 and 40 year experienced electricians like we had 10 years ago. Right. A lot of those folks retired. So it's more important than ever to give that foreman back their time and allow them to be guiding the installation process. Because if you're not there, that might require some taking things down and redoing it. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the real waste on a project. Yeah. All right, so you've laid out some really cool things and uh, transitions in business and learning new things. Organizational change is tough <laughs> um, to, to you know, move into new systems and to, to trust new things that are, you know, we're trying to do in our workflows. So what are the best next steps for a contractor to take to begin creating systems that tie these disparate systems together? It's, all right, we know we can be more efficient. We know contractor X down the street you know, has a prefab shop, and we want to start implementing prefab. So I always say it starts with a conversation. You can go to you know, AECINSPIRE, AECINSPIRE.com, go to the homepage and click on start a conversation or schedule a meeting. I forget what it's called. Yeah. And it ties right to my calendar. They can click on it, book a meeting with me, or I'm adam at AECINSPIRE.com, and they can send me an email and set up a conversation just to learn more about their business. But what's really cool, like my favorite thing to, to do is to understand what a contractor is at. Because we have contractors that are billion dollars a year. Our smallest customer does two million a year. And that's what's so fun is 
working with the big guys. And oftentimes that's a longer sales cycle because there's a lot more people involved and they already have systems they've built up over 10 years that are, are really good systems. Mm -hmm. And they had to build them because quite frankly, we didn't exist. But once they see what we're doing, they're like, oh man, we spent 10 years doing this. I'm like, I know, but they're like, but I can see where this is gonna save me 50% of time and all right, I'll make the switch. Or it's a smaller firm that's like, man, I'm, I'm just, I don't use technology. I'm not real tech savvy. Uh, you know, we don't have a prefab shop. How do we do this stuff? That's my favorite, the, some of my favorite guys to talk to. Well, learning that technology takes time it, and, and you're going to have errors and you know what yep, I mean? Yep. And, and, uh, but it's by having it be user friendly, you know, it follows their normal workflow and, and it's, it's very simple. You know, oftentimes I'll say, Hey, do you have an internship program? Do you know, do you have like a, a nephew or a niece that, you know, needs a job? Cause they're digital natives. You have all the skilled knowledge of electrical they know how to use technology. Why don't you work with them and they can help you adopt this. But also some of our best users are field electricians that are in their sixties mm. because they know how to do this stuff. They just needed a tool to make it easy. Right. And so they do that. But those guys that don't have prefab shops, we've got what's called the, the manufactured assembly provider network embedded right into the software. So oftentimes what that is, is contractors that built prefab shops and they have excess capacity. But they're already using AC Inspire. So when the smaller customer designs their project in, in AC Inspire, and then they say, hey, I want to buy some prefab, we connect them with that contractor, that provider. They can then walk them through, hey, here's the stuff that I learned along my journey of doing prefab, and here's where I'm at today, and here's what I suggest for this project based upon what I'm seeing. And that person that's never tried prefab before gets that first-hand experience from the guy that has already done it, or I guess second-hand experience sure. through the guy that's already done it, and then we just facilitate that transaction. So now they're implementing prefab without a prefab shop, and they're able to act and compete with the larger shops that have spent all that time and money growing that operation. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to help the big guys just become that much more efficient, but also it, it warms my heart to help the smaller firm be able to implement these same workflows because there's plenty of work to go around. <laughs> there's so much work out there right. that there's just not enough you know, people to get the job done. So we just have to be that much more efficient. Yeah. What what role or how does distribution come into play? Maybe more specifically around you know the the more specific um, solution you're talking about. It, great question. So there are opportunities for distribution employees to leverage technology like AC Inspire to help the contractor. Because remember, the contractor can't hire enough estimators to do counting. In fact, I had a top 50 contractor reach out to me just on Friday and say, hey, we got this huge project, we got a problem. How can you help us you know, get these counts faster mm. and estimate this work? So we put together a team of people and we're helping them get those counts. And it's the distributor using our software, helping them get the counts done. And then they're putting it all in there and they're giving it to them so they can go finish their work. Okay. Ideally, they win that work and then the rest of the process we've talked about then will continue from there. But uh, contractors are looking for help anywhere they can get it. Sure. And a natural place for them to look for is their trusted distributor. Yeah. So distributors don't just have physical logistics services. It's not all about conduit carts and fixture carts and, mm. and shark carts for consumable materials or or smart reels or Moffitt trucks for, for wire management. It's also about, hey, can you help me count this project? Can you double check my counts for me? We've got, you know, a, a kid nine months into distribution was delivering pizzas at Papa John's. <laughs> he got his hands on the software. Within a week, he was probably one of our more, more proficient users because he's a digital native. Mm. And then he's teamed up with a very high performing sales rep that just has a few contractors. So the contractor comes in and gives some counts for a project. He says, hey, send me, send me those drawings too. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, we're gonna double check these counts. He's like, okay. And then they turn them around very quickly. Hey, here's your quote that you asked for, for the counts you gave us, the spreadsheet you gave us, but also here's the accurate counts. You missed 32 fixtures. It's only 5,500 bucks, but we want you to have the right number. So why don't you just use this? You know, a week later, that sales rep got a three quarter of a million dollar lighting package order. Mm. And, it, and he's like, well, how did I get that? And he's like, because you corrected our counts. You know, we were going to be on the hook for those missing fixtures, but almost more important than the 5,500 bucks is the rework that it was going to require 
well, we got to send guys back and we mm-hmm. got to expedite the order. And, and then yeah. the distributor has to go through fire drills to get that material out to the job site. So it's how can we collaborate better in a digital environment, you know, a cloud-based platform where everybody can get information in real time, not from the single source of truth, because there's data everywhere, but a common source of truth that's accessible for people. Mm -hmm. And it just helps them get the information they need when they need it. Uh, So it's, it's those, those, I see those digital services starting to come more and more into play in our industry because, you know, you might have a project like a, a high school coming into a, a, a market and it's going to get built. Well, you might have 10 contractors do that exact same takeoff. Mm-hmm. So more and more markets we're learning around the country are going from contractor led counts to distributor led counts or, or lighting agent led counts. Mm. Um, all right, let's look just a real quick look forward question. Cause I know you like thinking about the future all the time. I know you're a forward thinking person. Where do you, where do you see construction software moving forward the next, you know, just few years? <sighs> I mean, back to artificial intelligence, it it is going to impact everybody's lives over the next five years. I mean, technology is only going to continue to accelerate in the amount of applications out there. I mean, AI is helping coders code faster, right? It's helping, you know, you don't need as many lawyers because they're writing contracts. Uh, So it's going to impact a lot of different industries. So I had a conversation um, last Thursday with a guy. He's about ready to retire, and he said a year and a half is what he has left. (laughs) But it was one of my best conversations because he was so in on what we were doing because it's adoption of – he he loves change. He loves looking at new technology. I mean, he's going back. He's teaching at a local university. He's teaching estimators, and he's teaching communication Mm. because, you know, just technology – and communication of information is just so important. So that's what he's excited about. And not because he's gonna you know, make a bunch more money, he's already made plenty of money. He's concerned about the people that have been working for him to te- for 10 to 15 years, they're gonna take over that next, when he, when he retires. And he wants to set them up for success. So that's what got him so excited about what we were doing. What part of the construction process do you think could uh, use some help and that could be supported by technology, either AI or whatever? I mean, it's, what aspect can't? I mean, really, mm-hmm. it's it's there's room for improvement everywhere. I mean, I'm constantly trying to get better myself because I know I, I make mistakes and I'm not as great as I think I am. Uh, but it just we've found, I mean, prefab managers, those guys are just drowning. Uh, they, they don't have usually great solutions. That's where, where we start with, like I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I'm finding more and more estimating departments are like, oh, my God, this is this is really slick. Um, so it's the field guys, you know, having a plan, I, I forget who said it. I don't know if it was Eisenhower or somebody, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Uh, so, but also no plan, you know, makes it past the first engagement with the enemy. And that's why you have to be able to adapt and change to the inevitable changes that will happen on a construction project. Um, but really there, there's room for improvement everywhere along the line. You know, nobody's perfect, yeah. myself included. Yep. All right. Well, Adam, I like to close out the conversation by focusing on the why of what we do. So um, what motivates you to do this day in and day out? What keeps you passionate about what you do? It, it's, it goes back to uh, some stuff we touched on. You know, I'm a family man, you know, my wife and kids, um, you know, got to provide for them, right? So that's mm-hmm. kind of first and foremost. And I think in most of our minds is how can we make sure we take care of our family and give them the opportunities they need to be successful in their lives, right? Yeah. Uh, the second thing I think about is my investors, the ones that you know took a chance on on us and, mm-hmm. and believed in what we're doing, and they gave us some money, and they're expecting me to you know get up bright and early and and work my tail off all through the evening until I got to go coach that next team. Mm-hmm. So I think about them. But what's really cool about our industry is I, I was just down in Florida for a conference this last year. I came across a guy I had met nine years prior one time at a at a trade show, and we looked at each other. He's like. Adam, I'm like Chris, he's like, yeah. And we just, we sat down and had lunch. It's, this industry is so full of, of amazing, great, hardworking, salt of the earth people that are just trying to do a good job mm-hmm. and, and trying to get better. And, and that's, I mean, other than, you know, the inevitable 
family and investors, right? Yeah. It's, it's the people in this industry that are so much fun to work with, that are good people. You know, you'll work hard during the day, you'll grab a beer after work, you know, you talk about life and you get to know each other yeah. and then you, you do it all over again the next day. And uh, it's the people, man. They're, I love this industry, I love the people. Most contractors are family businesses. Yeah. You know, my family, third generation, my brothers and cousins are, are taken over from my uncles that are just recently retired, yeah. you know, at the, from the business grandpa started. A lot of contractors fit that model. Right. And even in the big guys that have gone to ESOPs or, or even publicly traded, sure. still sons and daughters are following their parents. I mean, yeah. I, I go on vacation every year with a buddy of mine from grade school. We met in kindergarten and we have kids around the same age. His dad was electric or electric or electrician here in St. Louis. He was a business agent. And guess what? He's an electrician. He's one of the best foreman with my little brother here in town. Interesting. And so it's 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 neat to see those those different people grow up in the in the in the industry, but also in those companies and take on those roles, just like you said. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, Adam, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to you know talk more, but I really want to get to that meal that we're going to go to. So you know we can continue the conversation there. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is a true joy, and and to get here in person, this is awesome. Yep. So thank you. That was my conversation with Adam Ketterer, co-founder and senior sales director at AEC Inspire. You can connect with Adam and what he's working on by heading to the links in the show notes. I would love to hear what software you're using to help you get your jobs done more efficiently. You can email me at podcast at graybar.com. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, you can really help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving a five-star rating in your favorite podcast player and on YouTube. Thanks for listening to this episode of Keeping the Lights On. We'll see you next time. What advice would you give to 18-year-old Adam? Uh, 18-year-old Adam was a dumbass, uh, but we're, we're trying to get a little smarter every day. Yep. Uh, so the first one I would say is one of uh, Stephen Covey's rules. You know, mm -hmm. Seek first mm -hmm. to understand before trying to be understood. You know, we've all got ideas in our head, and we can't wait to get them out. Yep. But I've learned uh, through painful experiences that it's better to ask questions of the audience and get to know them a little bit, figure out where they're at. And then once you, you've dove deep enough to really get a good understanding and proven that you care, yeah. then you can start to communicate what you want to communicate. Right. But human, you know, humans care about themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> once, the, once the audience knows, all right, you actually care about them, then they're more apt to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's good advice. Um, all right. So this is an interesting episode change on my first question here. So this is the first time this is going to happen. But